Thanks, Dr. Roney. I know we're a little delayed. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty, but I think we're good to go now. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, the topic of this discussion is gonna be gut health. So I'm gonna go through everything you need to know about gut health and how it is implicated in chronic disease. Okay, so by the end, I think you'll have a real good understanding of a very good systematic step-by-step -step formula to be able to kind of diagnose and, and then heal your gut, maybe with the help of a practitioner. So one thing I wanna start with, a couple weeks ago, I did a Facebook Live that talked about the immune system and the inflammatory windup that happens uh, from immune dysregulation. If you have an opportunity, please uh, review that one because what I talked about is the uh, immune system dysregulation and inflammation and what fuels it. And one of the main fuels that we're gonna see in chronic disease is what we put into our body, but also the health of our gut. So it's a foundation Kitty gave me the thumbs up that we're technically good. Okay, <laughs> so it's the foundation for health. So what we wanna do is make sure you understand this one concept, well there's a bunch, but this concept. Your gut can't heal if it's inflamed, okay? I'll add something to that. Your gut can't heal if there's infections in the gut. Your gut can't heal if the biome, what they call the microbiome, is affected. So we're gonna walk you through the stomach the small intestine and the large intestine step by step and explain what happens when we eat food and, and it goes through those systems or those areas and then what could happen when they break down and what, what infections could affect the stomach and the small intestine, large intestine and other issues that you need to be aware of. Because as we work through it in a functional medicine approach, the idea is we have to test, we have to treat and then we have to retest. It's the only way we know that you're healed, that your gut is now healthy. So we're gonna take you through that formula, okay? And it is, it's a system. It's a systematic step-by-step -step formula that allows people to get well as far as gut health. But I will tell you, to add on to this, when, it, when we're talking about chronic disease, whether it's the gut, your liver, and I'll take you through some of the fuels to the fire. Your gut, your liver, infections in the system, uh, things like blood sugar imbalances, hormonal imbalances, uh, chemical exposure, increased toxins, uh, what they call xenobiotics, synthetic chemicals, etc. All of these things can increase your inflammatory response as well to create chronic disease. So I'm going through one of them, but every one of those things I mentioned, and there are others, have a specific step-by-step -step formula to be able to test for it, treat it, and then retest to make sure it's gone. If we can do that with a person that's going through a chronic disease, we have now cleaned up the causes to their disease. That gives them the best chance to heal and the lowest chance for reoccurrence. So basically, things that I'm going to talk about are going to minimize your downside and maximize your upside. That's all we can do, okay? So the gut, very important. So let's start. When we, we chew our food, right? First thing that's gonna happen in the mouth, we're gonna have enzymes released that are supposed to break down starches, which are carbohydrates, okay? That, they call that bolus. It's not important, but they call it bolus. That gets then swallowed down, and again, my, my drawing really good here, <laughs> down the esophagus, and it gets into the stomach. When it's in the stomach, there's a couple things that happen. One, we get a strong muscular contraction in the stomach, and we get the mixture of hydrochloric acid and something called digestive enzymes to help break that food, that bolus, into a frothy liquid called chyme, okay? Once it's in that chyme uh, consistency, it's then transferred or passed into the small intestine. So the small intestine here is roughly 20 plus feet of a long tube. So basically, this is a closed tube from the time it enters your esophagus all the way to the time it leaves your body it's supposed to be a closed environment, okay? Now, when it gets into the small intestine, the first third, called the duodenum, duodenum, tomato, tomato, right? You're going to have release uh, or other organs that help out the process. You're gonna get the liver and the gallbladder. Well, basically the liver is going to produce bile and emit bile, and bile is gonna help break down fats into fatty acids and glycerol, right? The pancreas is gonna help, and it's gonna help uh, secrete enzymes to break carbohydrates down into glucose, okay? 
And then of course you have digestive enzymes that are gonna help break proteins down as well into single amino acid form, okay? So we get the, this, this chyme, it's released into the small intestine. The liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas also release their digestive enzymes and break it down into smaller particles, right? Glucose, fatty acids and glycerol, and single amino acid form. Now, what happens then is through this process, it'll start to get absorbed, those three different, right, carbs, proteins, and fats, will start to get absorbed into the bloodstream. So we'll call these blue dots the bloodstream. Now, what, it then, what then happens, it gets taken into the cell and assimilated, right? Which means it gets used for energy. Everybody okay with that so far? All right, so keeping it as simple at this point as possible, that's how we eat food, it gets broken down, it gets absorbed through the small intestine wall, and then it gets assimilated into the cell to be used for energy. Is everybody okay? That's, we're being remedial, but just to give you an idea. Now I'll start talking about where we can get problems happening, okay? So number one, what we eat is incredibly important to the process. So I didn't say this, right? This was, yeah, sorry. We had technical difficulties, so I already I did this, but I'm gonna re, re, uh, redo this uh, little lecture. What we eat is significant to the process. So I talked about farm to table. And what I mean by that is uh, kind of a paleo concept. Now, not for everybody, just so you know, different, uh, different chronic illnesses will dictate what kind of diet people are put on. But I will tell you, the cleaner, the better. So one ingredient foods, right, are, are gonna be better, and I'll explain. And then if I'm on a deserted island, what could I eat? I could either hunt, uh, well, they call it pick it or chase it. I could either hunt something down, kill it, and then I could eat it, or I could pick berries, nuts, fruits, etc. right? Good fats, etc. So we wanna be as clean as possible. So the pick it or chase it concept, or the one ingredient food concept. So I'll give you an example. I have chicken, I have sweet potato, I have avocado. Each one of those is one ingredient. Right? So if I'm taking that in and taking those foods in, I have less chemicals, I have less additives, I have less preservatives, xenobiotics, etc., which is gonna have less insult on my digestive system. Would you all agree, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, the other thing, it's gonna reduce my chances for something called food sensitivities. So what is a food sensitivity? Basically, and food sensitivities happen mostly with the protein content of the food, just so everybody's clear, right? The protein content of certain foods is going to increase the immune response in the body. Okay? We don't want that. We don't want an increased immune response. So how do we do that? How do we reduce it? A couple different ways. Number one, it's what we put in like we talked about. Number two, when it gets into the stomach, we need plenty of hydrochloric acid, okay? And we also need plenty of digestive enzymes. So one of the things that I recommend to almost every patient that I deal with is di our digestive enzymes, and I'm gonna tell you why. When I eat a protein that's cooked, okay, it changes the protein structure. So a raw protein versus a cooked protein is drastically different. They call it, it's a denatured protein, and it's gonna take enzymes to break it down. So I'll give you a quick example. If I had a piece of fish, you can use an apple, whatever. If I had a, a, a piece of fish and I laid it on the ground, right? And I just left it there. Versus I cooked a piece of fish and I left it there. The raw fish will be oxidized maybe a couple days tops, right? Your live enzymes that are in that fish are gonna help break it down. Whereas the cooked one is different now. So the cooked one's gonna cook all the live enzymes out for the most part, and we're gonna be dealt with this piece of fish that won't break down. Does that make sense? You can do that with a burger, you can do it with an apple, same thing, cook it versus raw. And that tells you the live enzymes are still there to help break down that food for you. That's important. In a cooked world, right, we do a lot of cooking in our society, you want digestive enzymes for that reason and that reason alone, right? There's other reasons, but you definitely want those enzymes to be able to denature or break down that protein into single amino acid form, okay? So digestive enzymes are critical, Hydrochloric acid is critical. What are some of the issues that we could see happening in the stomach, okay? We could see reflux, okay? We could see uh, ulcers, okay? We could see GERD, 
Nobody know what GERD is? Gastric reflux disease, right? Okay, and then we could see infections. And the main infection is H. pylori. That could happen. So if I have a patient that comes in and they're having stomach issues, not lower bowel issues, but stomach issues, they have reflux, or they're burping constantly, or you know, they're, they have a history of ulcers, etc. This This is somebody that we have to look at the stomach to see, number one, do they have enough hydrochloric acid, okay? Are we, are we having, do we have enough digestive enzymes, but also do we have something like H. pylori that's creating those symptoms, okay? So we need to make sure we're testing for that. Now again, this is symptom driven, right? If they don't have those symptoms, we don't necessarily have to look at that too much, but we definitely wanna make sure that this stomach is doing what it's supposed to do. So that's the first thing. Now, what's gonna help that, and I go back to this every time, is what you put into the stomach, okay? The good foods are gonna be less insulting to the stomach. Is everybody okay with that? So we have digestive enzymes, hydrochloric acid, and we can't have an H. pylori infection in there, or a duodenal, or I'm sorry, peptic ulcer or something like that, okay? So, common issue with GERD, okay? Reflux, is that we tend to have too little stomach acid, all right? It's, so we might get high, uh, reflux, which is acidic, right? A lot of times it's because we don't have enough hydrochloric acid, we eat foods, the foods ferment in the gut, and it causes the parietal cells to over, um, overproduce hydrochloric acid. So we get excess acid, but it starts with too little acid, okay? That's the most common cause of reflux, number one. Number two is H. pylori. Okay, so we've got to look at that in totality before we even get to the small intestine. Is everybody good with that so far? Okay. Now, once we get into the small intestine, we're, here are the problems we could have. We could have, you guys familiar with the term leaky gut? Okay, or intestinal permeability. How about SIBO? You guys ever hear of SIBO? Okay, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, I'll talk about that. We could have infections in the gut. So what are the, some of the common infections we could have? We could have fungal infections. We could have yeast overgrowth called candida, right? We could have uh, bacterial infections. We could have viral infections, etc. So parasitic, got yeah, parasitic, that's a big one, right? Parasitic. So again, if we have these, this gut will not be able to heal. It's impossible, okay? So one of the things personally that I do with patients with symptoms, I test for these infections. There's a couple labs out there, Cyrex labs being one of them, that test for uh, a bunch of these, up to 30 different uh, infections that could occur, and they're the 30 most common that are seen statistically. So we, we definitely wanna make sure there's no infections. If there's infections, that kind of stumps or, or trumps everything as far as the treatment. We need to get rid of those, because remember, infections are gonna create what? Inflammation. Inflammation, right? So we have to make sure that the infections are gone. Now, secondarily to these infections, or the overall systemic inflammatory response, we could get something called intestinal permeability, which means I eat these foods, and it's especially proteins again, right? These are, the, these are sometimes the bad ones, that don't get broken down into single amino acid form, okay? So they, they get, bunched amino acids. And what'll happen is they will start to permeate through the digestive wall. Now let's talk about this for a second. In your small intestine, it's supposed to be a closed tube, okay? We have these tight junctions that only certain things are supposed to pass through. Your amino acids, your fatty acids and glycerol, right? And your glucose molecules. And they absorb through the small intestine and then it's the cell that it uh, assimilates and uses it for energy. We good with that? What happens because of infections and because of inflammation, et cetera, poor uh, pre, pre and probiotic, the microbiome, we start to get a widening of those junctions. So instead of like this, that only lets certain things through that it's supposed to, it starts to widen, okay? When it widens, now some of these undigested proteins start to leak through the gut, okay, into the bloodstream. The problem is now the immune system, sorry, looks at that and goes, I don't know what that is. So what do you think it does? It attacks it, okay? What does the attack lead to? Inflammation, okay? 
So now you get more inflammation based on this leaky gut response. Now, other things can leak through too, the additives, the preservatives, the chemicals, the toxins that are supposed to remember being this closed tube. Then what happens, those toxins get to the liver, the liver goes through phase one, phase two, uh, what they call biotransformation, gets it in the water soluble form, those toxins, and kicks it into the large intestine to be excreted by the body. But if before it does all that, it starts to leak through, they start to leak through because of this leaky gut, now we have problems, okay? Now we're getting an exacerbated immune response. Not only that, we'll start to get malabsorption too, okay? So these are things that are gonna start affecting our health dramatically. So when we do, there's a, there's a test that a lot of the clinicians here do, myself included, called the nutri valve. The nutri valve is your metabolites, right? It's the end stage, what's going on? Do we need more of something, less or something? My opinion a lot of times, not, not with everybody, but a lot of times to me, the nutri valve is a symptom, if that makes sense. Right? If I'm low on X, Y, or Z, perhaps it's because my digestive system is breaking down and I'm not absorbing properly and I'm not getting everything out of my foods or even my supplements that I need to. So I always look at that with, um, I guess, bated breath, if you will. And I wanna make sure, hey, I'm okay with giving supplements over here with the nutri -Val, but I wanna know why I'm low on X, Y, or Z. And then sometimes this gut, if I fix the gut, the nutri valve gets better. Does that make sense? You okay with that? So I look at it a little different. I look at it as a symptom, not necessarily um, a, a primary problem, if you will. Now, it could be that somebody's just not getting good food intake. Um, they're not maybe, their gut is not uh, breaking down and absorbing properly, who knows? But it's still, to me, a little bit of a symptom. So we can have that malabsorption taking place. So we could have infections, we could have leaky gut, we could have something called SIBO. So have we heard of that? No, that's a new one. SIBO is small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So to keep it simple, what happens? This valve here is called the ileocecal valve, okay? And it separates the small intestine, the last third of the small intestine from your large intestine. And it's a valve that opens and closes, or it should. What tends to happen is certain causes keep that valve kind of open and a lot of times the bacteria from the large intestine, I'll use the term translocates into the small intestine, okay? So now, this is somebody, the main symptom of SIBO is somebody when they eat, especially starches or carbohydrates, they get bloated right away, okay? So if I see that as a symptom, I'll have a patient just eat carbohydrates for two straight meals and I wanna know what happens. And then I ask them to eat some protein, just protein and see what happens and then just carbs and see what happens. If they're good with protein and carbs, it's a good sign that they have SIBO, which is small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So we have to then, te I then test for that. So that lab again, Cyrex Labs has a good uh, SIBO test. And then of course, just like anything, we have to figure out how to get rid of it, okay? So sometimes, not necessarily SIBO, but some of these infections, patients come here, especially to the clinic, usually for mostly natural care, right? However, I explain to patients, if some of these heavy duty infections show up, naturally we could take care of them. It may take a, a quite a bit of time. So we give the patient the option, hey, do you want something medically, conventionally, to go in and kill that thing so we can get moving quicker, right? So sometimes you gotta take a step back in order to take 50 forward. And, and my opinion, depending on the person, we want expedited health, right? We wanna get them to a point quicker, but some people are like, no, I don't want anything conventional. So we have ways that we could help with the infections naturally. It just may take a little longer, but it definitely depends on the infection that the person has, okay? Everybody okay with that so far? All right, so you have your infections, you have your leaky gut, you have your SIBO, all right? Those are the main things that are gonna create this whole issue with the gut, okay? So far, good, right? All right, now, another issue that uh, can happen with the gut beyond your, your uh, leaky gut, beyond your infections, behind your SIBO, is a bad microbiome. You ever heard that term? So basically, you have a ratio of good bacteria versus bad bacteria, okay? Good bacteria, is gonna keep the bad bacteria in check. I'm gonna keep it as simple as possible, okay? So that's your 
probiotics basically. And a lot of times if these probiotics start to get diminished, what's one way that they can get diminished? Antibiotics. Yeah, antibiotics, right? So if somebody's on a lot of antibiotics, we know that their probiotics can get diminished. And one of the things that the probiotic does is it helps keep yeast in check. So yeast is a normal part of your microbiome at certain levels. But if the probiotics are reduced, yeast has not a chance to go up. So again, when we do an evaluation and we do a history on a patient, we have to find out have they been on probiot or uh, have they been on antibiotics repeatedly for different uh, issues? And if so, that's probably an area that we need to look is test for candida or yeast overgrowth, okay? And then we have to get to work on changing that microbiome for them. The other thing, if you ever heard of a prebiotic, a prebiotic, to keep it simple, is a food source for the probiotic. Okay, so sometimes when all this is going on and we're not getting the proper breakdown, we're leaking, etc., we can get an issue with these pre and probiotics. So we have to add them in sometimes, okay? And there's a certain level to do that. So starting from the top, going to stomach, large in or small intestine into the large intestine, everybody good with the major things that could happen and break down? All right, so I'm gonna tell you how we heal this. Okay, it's called the four R's program. All right, so I'm gonna just erase real quick. I know I had it somewhere. Oh, sorry, real quick. Sorry about that. So the four R's program is designed to take a step-by-step -step approach in order to heal this. So number one, we have to remove, okay? So A, we have to remove infections. That's number one. And B, we have to remove insulting foods. Okay? So like we talked about, a lot of patients I'll put on a very strict diet and, it, and it's different for everybody to a degree. Meaning some people, I have to tell them you've got to do this almost 100% to heal. And some people, they can probably do it a little bit less. So I'll, just as an example, I'll draw a scale zero to 100, and I'll ask them, where do you wanna go, right? If they say, well, 100 means they have to be really, really strict for an extended period of time, and they can't do that, I'm okay with starting them here, say it's 75%, I just let them know it's gonna take a little longer to heal. And, I, and we're, we're very pragmatic about it, right? It's like, that's okay, you could do that, we're not gonna push into doing it, but just know it might take a little longer to get well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So most people then go, you know what, I'll do 100. Because <laughs> usually that means more of this, right? Yeah. All right, so remove is the first R. The second R is to replace, okay? And we want to replace digestive enzymes, and if need be, HCL and things like that, right? So we want to get that stomach better. So remove infections, insulting foods, replace digestive enzymes. Number three, move this out of the way, we want to re-inoculate which means we have to re-inoculate with good pre and probiotics most of the time. We've got to get that microbiome better, okay? But again, if you go back, there's a systematic approach to it. We've got to get infections and insulting foods out of the way. And I'll give you another, you know, that, that Facebook Live I did a couple weeks ago was on the inflammatory process. That's part of my uh, approach as well. So we got three, re-inoculate, and then four, repair. Okay, so then once we get all this going, and not before, we start to repair these, this mucosal lining. So we want to get those tight junctions back to where they're supposed to be, so only the things that are supposed to get through there get through there. But again, if you remember, you can't have infections, inflammation, SIBO, etc., and expect to repair the gut. So sometimes, you know, I see patients on some of this stuff, they're still having symptoms and never been checked for some of these things. So it's, it's kind of like they're swimming upstream. Yes, it can be a Band-Aid and it can help, but we're talking about healing, right? So this is where we talk. It's a test, treat, retest mentality. If we do that and we understand all this that's going on, we have a great chance of getting that gut healed from start to finish, okay? So this gives you an idea, I know it's a lot, 
but it'll be on Facebook. You can go back and watch it, but it gives you an idea from start to finish. And there's more to it, right? We didn't want to get crazy in, in a half hour, but this is a pretty good start as far as how to heal your gut from start to finish. Okay, everybody good? Any questions? I know there's a lot there, but I'll take questions. Yes, sir. I know we've talked before, but yeah. what does the duodenum have to do with? Yeah, it's the first third of the small intestine, right? So your first third of the small intestine is where a lot of the absorption takes place. So that's where, you know, a lot of your pre and probiotics, a lot of the, the leaky gut can take place because that's where a lot of absorption. Now, absorption takes place through the entire small intestine, but for the most part, that first third is really important for that process. How large is it? Yeah, well, if it's, if it's tw roughly 24 feet, 26 feet of small intestine, you know, you're talking about eight maybe, around eight feet long of the first third of the duodenum. Then it's the genum and then it's the ileum, the last third. Yeah. So pretty much if you're talking in here, somewhere to here, and then you got to here, and then you have this last part here, okay? Helpful? What uh, duodenal or uh, duodenum is there? I know we talked about specifically your issue, but. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, what was it? Uh, as far as, the, did you have a specific like question about the duodenum or duodenum? Uh, no, not, no. Okay, good, okay. Mm -hmm. I was just making sure I, I answered that thoroughly. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you believe there's a link towards like eczema and gut health? Oh yeah, without question. So the question was, do you believe that there's a link between eczema and gut health? Uh, I will tell you that is the link, right? So basically everything that, that we talked about today will manifest itself as inflammation in the body, eczema, right? It could make psoriasis worse. It can make any skin condition dramatically worse because of the inflammatory wind up that happens from all this, for sure. This is also, right, I didn't mention it, but it's so important to mention, and I'm glad you kind of triggered that. This is your second brain, by the way, okay? If this is bad, you're almost guaranteed to have neurological insult to the body, right? And I just did a little bit of study this morning on something called microglial priming. And what that means is these microglial in our, in our brain that are supposed to be really good for us, start to get primed. And when they're primed, they're, they're almost at max threshold. So any little insult from the, from the chin down can create the priming, which then they'll start to almost break down our own neurons. So basically, it's when we talk about the brain, from here down, if we're healthy from here down, gut being one of the most important to that, low inflammation, good gut health, low toxins, etc we're gonna have a good chance for this brain not to neurodegenerate. So again, that's a whole other, I did a, a lecture about uh, two months ago on Alzheimer's and dementia. That microglial priming, priming is significant based on a lot of things that happen uh, below the neck. The gut is the big factor in that. So yeah, a lot of your immune windups, autoimmunity, a lot of theory out there, a lot of practitioners will tell you autoimmunity starts in the gut, okay? If you're not familiar with what autoimmunity is, it's the immune system mistaking your own tissue for foreign uh, invaders. So that lecture I did a couple of weeks ago helps you understand a little bit more about that and why that wind up happens and then what to do about it, okay? So I'll mention real quick uh, why, why I talked about the immune system. There are things that first and foremost, we have to decrease inflammation. Now remember, we have to decrease inflammation to be able to heal the gut, right? So even before we get rid of these infections and heal the leaky gut and do all this, I put patients on inflammatory reducing compounds or uh, uh, polyphenols. And they are in order, curcumin, okay? Resveratrol, you guys have heard of both of those, okay? Glutathione, in my opinion, is one of the most important that you could take, okay? Vitamin D is one or one A, okay? Vitamin D in patients with chronic disease, their vitamin D levels are almost always low. And I'll tell you why. Because vitamin D is, is helpful in immune regulation or, or T regulatory cell regulation, meaning the cells that regulate your immune system. If they're affected chronically by these immune, by these fuels, then your vitamin D is gonna constantly be trying to regulate your immune system. So it's like, it just wears out. So most patients with chronic disease are low on vitamin D. So it's a huge, huge 
um, uh, a supplement to take for sure. Mm -hmm. And one of the other ones, omega threes. Yeah. Okay, this right here. Okay, curcumin, resveratrol, glutathione, vitamin D, omega threes, and there are others, but I'll start with those. Are pretty much what I take every day. And all your major athletes that understand this, as far as wanting to recover quickly, take these things. And mm -hmm. the reason being, if you have low inflammation in your body, you're gonna be able to recover quickly at the cellular level, okay? So I'll, I use this example all the time, like Tom Brady, quarterback for the New England Patriots. He's going on 42. His lifestyle is very clean on what he puts in, very good, understands the whole gut issue, understands the whole inflammatory issue, and also trains properly for his, the body's ability to stay plastic and stay pliable and long and, and flexible and mobile, and he's still killing it at 42 years old. There's a formula. So if it's a formula that works for him, don't you think it could work for us too? It's no different. Now he might push it a little bit more, I get it, but the formula is I'm gonna stay healthy at the cellular level so my cells can heal faster than they break down. All these things, right, low inflammation, good gut health, and there's a number of other factors as well that I listed last week or a couple weeks ago, are going to allow that body the best chance to heal faster than it breaks down. So you maximize your upside and minimize your downside. In healthcare, that's all we can do, right? Usually what that's going to mean is I set my environment up for the best chance to heal, right, and prevent problems from happening in the future. And that's the key. Quality of life one, quantity of life two, okay? Quality of life's the key. So if all these things are done, you have a great shot, walking around, high energy, very low symptoms subjectively, objectively, the tests are coming out fine, and you're going, even if I get older, I'm still strong and healthy and moving the right way. So the one thing I do wanna end with, I hear all the time doctors say, well, it's just, you're normal. It's normal for your age, you're getting older, okay? The one thing I want to make sure I tell you is that that is not true. It's common, but it's not normal, okay? Normal is waking up every day energetic. I eat foods. I don't get symptomatic. They give me energy, maybe a little bit of energy or sustenance. I go to sleep. I can get to sleep okay. I can stay asleep okay. I sleep a good amount of time. I wake up refreshed, and I feel good throughout the day. That's the norm, okay? In our society, the other is the norm but it's a formula that it takes in order to create that norm. Okay, is everybody good? Any other, was that a lot? Was that okay? That was good. Helpful? Yeah, very helpful. Any, any questions? I, I just wanna get back yeah. to, I do have a question. What is the function of the dwarf? And is there an end, is there a valve at the end of the dwarf? No, it's just, a, it's just basically the way they break it, break it up but it's, it's part of the small intestine and the duodenum is designed mostly for absorption of food, right? But you also have your prebiotics, your probiotics. It, it's, it's all, it has things that biome, has things in it to keep your, your, your self healthy. So the whole idea with this gut, it's a closed system, right? We don't want things coming in or going out that aren't supposed to be there. That's the job of the gut, it's closed. We don't want things penetrating in or out and that's what we talked about as far as the breakdown as to why. Okay, but absorption, I would say, is probably the main function. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's uh, one Facebook yeah. question. Anything. Uh, it says, any disadvantage of having colon resection, remo removing about 50 centimeters due to colon cancer? No, no, I mean, uh, so the question was, is there any disadvantage to having a resection done due to colon cancer? And honestly, it might affect you somewhat, but I would say, I would argue that if that's the case, then I would definitely be doing this as much as you possibly can to again, maximize your upside. So there, there, could, be, there could be potential issues with that, okay? If all this isn't right. So again, if you have something like that, maybe a slight uh, disadvantage, if you will, because of the surgery, you wanna do it cleaner and better than most people. That's, that would be the best advice I could give. So no, it, it could, it may be, but it shouldn't be if you do the right things. Okay, that helpful? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Um, how many billion probiotics should you Yeah, have? you know, it depends on, uh, it depends on the person uh, and what their symptoms are. But it, around that 50 billion, somewhere in there is probably a good a day. I've seen, you know, people. What? 
You up to 200. The, oh, uh, <laughs> the question was how many probiotics, right? What, what number? So you'll see 50 billion, 500 billion, for most in that 50 billion range, right, of probiotics. But there's some that I might double or triple that depending on, you know, what's going on in their system. So, but on average, I'd say that's a good number. The number we have the perfectlyhealthy.com store, you know, that we, they can Oh yeah, all yeah, definitely. The, the store that we have has a lot of these products that I talk about as far as the remove, the replace, the re-inoculate, repair. They're stocked with them because all the clinicians here know the importance of the gut. And I'm telling you, they all, because I, I talked to them, they all work through a process for gut healing. So they stock the, the store. Perfectlyhealthy.com. Perfectly Healthy, that's the uh, Perfectly website. Perfectlyhealthy.com. Perfectlyhealthy.com is the website. How long do you stay on number one before you go to number two? How, yeah. What's sufficient? Yeah, that's that? great. Good question. It, it, what I like to do is I may not move on until I know that we've got the infection, so I retest. Potentially, but that could be different for everybody. So the question was, how long do we stay on number one, right? The remove part before we move on. Now, for some, I might do all of them at once while we're working on the removal part. So again, the first thing I might do is try to reduce the inflammation to make the effect of the infection less. So we have potential to heal. And then I may work them through this process while we're taking the infections out of the way. But if they're really bad, and, and not to get too, um, I guess, disgusting, but if they're diarrhea constantly and it's very watery, we're pro pretty much gonna have to stay there until we get this out of the way, right? That's a very acute infection, probably a bacterial infection most likely, uh, mm -hmm. that's creating that, potentially from food or some airborne or, or saliva-based or what have you. So I may stay on that longer uh, if, to get that out of the way before I move on. Okay. But I could do all of them at the same time and just work through like a candida infection because I feel like as we work through that, we could start healing the gut at the same time and do it simultaneously. But it is, it is individually based on what they're presenting. Okay. Hopefully that helps, yeah. So, but I will tell you, somebody will ask him to follow up with that. Well, how long will it take to heal my gut? I have no idea. Right? We put you through this process. Now, I will tell you with some people, I may increase their dose significantly based on my general parameters, right? So if somebody had really bad symptoms, I may up everything and mega dose it to help expedite the healing process and then pull them back when symptoms start to get better. And then we just go back and we, you know, if they had an infection going on and they had leaky gut, I, we'll keep redoing those tests. And until both of those are gone, that's how long it takes. That could be for some people. I've worked on guts for six, eight months, nine months, 10 months sometimes. We try, if it gets that long, I try to do other things simultaneously, whether it's, you know, work on the detox or adrenal support or something like that. So I try not to stay on that alone. It's just a matter of how much the patient can handle from a supplement standpoint as well. So we just, I just take it, um, you know, almost one step at a time with each individual. Okay, good questions though. Everybody good? All right, very helpful? Very helpful. Okay, all right, good. If um, So, Kitty told me to tell you to share, right? We have to share the uh, Facebook Live video, and that gets it out to more and more people, uh, from what I understand, is that true? Yes, that it helps? is. Okay, <laughs> that's great. I knew that, I was just playing. Okay, <laughs> have a good day, gang.